I'm fascinated by the fact, Alain, that uh, you're a Frenchman, uh -huh. born in Paris, and yet now you live in prob Shinley, Arizona, probably one of the remote, yeah. remotest places yeah. in the United States. It's what, four to five hours from the nearest airport? What's the big attraction in Shinley? Uh, Shinley is Canyon de Chez. That's, that's the big attraction. Um, it's, it's, you know, by Arizona Chamber of Commerce standards, the second largest canyon in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I haven't measured it, so I don't know. No, right. <laughs> the first no. one is the Grand Canyon and then Canyon de Chez. What brought you there? How did you end up in Well, we, uh, we wanted to live in, a, in an area that was uh, close to Native American culture. And part of that is my interest for the landscape, and part of it is my interest for the rock art. And part of it is because my wife is a teacher and she was interested in, in getting involved in teaching you know, with Native Americans. Now, you were trained uh, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Right. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background. I've always had an artistic background. My mother was a trapeze artist. Um, she did trapeze, uh, flying trapeze. Right. And, uh, um, you know, from the very beginning, I was in contact with what I would say is uh, the uh, performance side of art. And I, I'm convinced that photography is a performing art, just like trapeze, except we don't perform in, in front of a live audience that has come to see us, but we perform for people that just happen on, upon us that, we might, that are very curious to see the behind the scene kind of part of photography. Um, uh, my, my first you know, interest in art was painting and drawing and I ended up doing the Beaux Arts in Paris uh, and uh, you know, that, that was all I would do is paint and draw all day long. Um, what drew you to photography? Well, I, I had, um, I've always gone against the, the grain. I mean, when you do the Beaux Arts, you're told that photography is the medium that people who cannot draw choose. <laughs> and, and that sort of fascinated me. I, I wondered if it was really that easy, um, and I've always loved the challenge. I mean, I, I think uh, um, that, that really challenged me. And I found out that photography is very difficult, um, because in a sense, yes, yeah, certainly you don't have to know how to draw. Uh, the drawing is made by the lens. But on the other hand, you really have to know how to compose. You, ha you really have to know at what time to photograph, you know, light-wise. And you really have to be good with form, because you can't change anything that's in front of you. <laughs> you know, unlike painting where you can rearrange. Photography is a matter of how much I'm going to put in. You know, that is, you, want, you don't want this, you don't want that. And, and the painting is the opposite. That is, you start with an empty frame and you fill it up. Mm -hmm. While photography, you start with a full frame and you remove things. Uh, right. Right. Uh, but I, I think that there is a, something has to be said about photography and painting being, you know, fairly equal in their difficulty. And that is, if we look at the number of very successful painters in terms of how well known they are and, we, and how many successful photographers, you know, in terms of how famous they are. And we find out that, you know, there's not one that's outdoing the other. That's right. Um, I mean, in a sense, painting is outdoing photography by a large margin because they've been at it for so many more years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, in photography, most people would be at a loss to name more than five people. That's right. Um, and and uh, in, in painting, I think most people could name ten, you know. Uh, I, I've always wanted to make a living with photography uh, from the day that I started. But for a long time, I was totally convinced that I couldn't. That somehow there was this mental block in my mind that said, you can't make a living doing what you like. Um, I, I became aware of it um, when I was a graduate student. I was working on my PhD. And I, and I started becoming aware of that mental block as I was studying communication and so on. And then um, something interesting happened. As, as a grad student, I was making about $500 a month um, you know, from, from my assistantship. And I had this very simple breakthrough. I thought, could I make $500 a month selling photographs? And the answer was yes, because if you divide 500 by 30 days, it comes to, you know, maybe a few dollars a day. And I thought, well, yeah, if I keep at it, I probably can generate $500. And then I thought, well, then why put up with being abused as a graduate student and not just <laughs> do what I like? You know, that was the, right. the thinking that I had. Like I said, my mother was a trophies artist, but my father was an engineer. And the combination of the two, I think, has, has grown in me. Uh, I, I can't really explain it, I don't know if it's genetic, I don't know if it's cultural, but I have these two sides, um, you know, art, maybe, and science on the other. And, and I think that, you know, you can say art and business. Um, I love photography, I love being here, you know, and, and, and taking photographs, but then when I go home, I love the idea of making money out of the photograph. It, it doesn't bother me at all. I don't feel that I'm setting myself off, I don't, I don't have any of these hurdles that some people have. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it because um, I have a lot of people that are saying, I couldn't do it because I can't sell myself, I can't sell my soul. 
but then we don't have a problem being a waiter in a restaurant. Um, <laughs> and I love it. I mean, right. if that's what we want, fine. I mean, I, you know, and I'm not saying bad things about them. I'm just saying it seems that there is also a problem of thinking here that, you know, making a living as an artist is very difficult. And somehow, somewhere there's going to be concessions made. Um, and, and that's not a bad one. Right. I mean, to just say, well, okay, I'm going to do several sizes and I'm going to make some more affordable than others. I have no problem. Um, I, I just, I just think that what's important, you know, to, to go back to a serious approach to all of this, is is to retain the ability to do very high quality work, and that that can be the real trick. I mean, the very serious problem for me is to re remain able to do very high quality work, um, because it's obvious that 90% of the sales are going to be for lower price, cheaper items, in which you know, the, the quality isn't going to be the best that I can do, um, and and that. Um, I can I achieve because I have I have a few galleries that um, you know to which I give that, that higher quality work and and I keep reinvesting some of my income in, in producing you know G clays for example uh, right. uh, I did a series last year of, of uh, rock art on, on uh, watercolor paper that are probably the finest work I've ever done right. and that was a run of prints of just I think six images that cost me fifteen hundred dollars just for the printing. I could not afford it if I wasn't selling the less expensive prints. Right. So um, I think there is, there is a much more complex issue here than just than just saying I can't sell my soul. The issue is in order to sponsorize the higher quality work, I have to be able to sell lower price work. But the contact with the public, which, which I love and I really want to have that contact, uh, has taught me that people are very appreciative of me bringing some images to them. I mean, they, they are very happy. In a sense, there is an audience out there that wants this and, and who's never going to get it if you don't market it. And I, I found um, a very good spot, you know, to, uh, to obviously market the, the work. Um, and I think that's essential. It's, it's a matter of defining two things, you know, what is your subject and who is your audience? And, you know, I knew that my subject was landscape photography. I, I'm not that interested in people photography. And um, it, it's obvious that the, the audience for that is, are people that come from very far to see the landscape. And, and that the two come together at places like the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. uh, where you have people from all over the world. I mean, I, I, it's, I have it on my artist statement that my work is all over, collected all over the world. And, I, d I really didn't do a whole lot for it. I just, you know, sold in right. the right place. And they came <laughs> the world me. came to you. The world came to me, yeah. And, and it's interesting because people say, gee, from Paris to the Grand Canyon, you can't be farther apart. They don't realize that both places are cosmopolitan places. There's, n there's the world in Paris and there's the world in the Grand Canyon. Right. I don't sense that in Chile. It's different. You know, you have a small section of people only, but Grand Canyon, it's very cosmopolitan. Well, I, I think that digital photography or digital imaging is what made me successful. Um, why? For two reasons. Uh, first of all, it made a lot of things very, let's say, financially sound. That is, I did not have to invest or pay somebody to do all these things. I could just take it on my time. That is, I would, I would spend my time instead of spending money and paying a, a lab or to do certain things. And I believe that I could do them better. And so it increased the quality, it, it allowed me to make a product that was more affordable, and it allowed me to market it successfully. Um, so that's one side. The other side is, there had always been in my mind, this is the business side, you know, the science side. And then on the artistic side, there had always been this split in my mind between painting and photography. That is, I always resented that I couldn't quite put my hands into the photo photograph and, and manipulate things and, and change things. And when digital imaging became possible on the desktop in color and with all you know, the quality that I wanted, I, I found out that it allowed me to merge the two. Right. So that suddenly I could draw from my background as a painter and from my knowledge as a photographer and, and just seamlessly, you know, use everything I had. You know, we had a transition time where I think to, to have the best marketing effort, it, it's smarter to just have a little bit of everything. Um, and especially have traditional photography and digital photography side by side. Uh, for a long time, I had only digital, and I, and I had a lot of people that said, well, I would prefer a traditional photograph. And so I started offering both, and, and I enlarged my, my, my audience, basically. Well, rock art is, uh, you know, paintings and carvings on rocks, and it's obviously a prehistoric thing. It dates back from the Anastasis, 700 years old and beyond. It could be several thousand years old. Um, I find it fascinating because it's really, for me, a form of landscape photography because it's, in, you know, they're designed on the landscape. They are images painted on the landscape, on the rocks. 
Um, and, you know, there's this mystery behind it. We are not sure what it means. Uh, I don't really engage in finding out what it means. I just photograph it and that, in a sense, gives me a lot of liberty. Rock art is difficult to find because one of the ways that we protect it from, you know, let's say graffiti and, and other forms of, of distraction is, is secrecy. And um, a lot of these panels are not publicly advertised. They are not on maps, they are not on guides. I was there at sunset. <laughs> it was my first visit. And um, I know that because it's in a canyon, when the sun sets, the other side of the canyon will project a shadow. That's basically going to be a flat bottom shadow, you know, a vertical line. And so I, I set up the uh, Hasselblad and I tried to trigger the shadow at the right time. There really isn't time for a second exposure because the sun moves very, very fast and I, I did not know I got it. Um, once I had the photograph, I wasn't sure if I could hold the contrast because there's an enormous amount of contrast. It's and a huge range. Yeah, and, and I worked this in Photoshop and did a lot of mask, uh, contrast mask, to, to hold this back. Mm -hmm. uh, I also increased a little bit of the, you know, let's say the separation between the background black, the black rock and, and the rock art itself. Then uh, one other thing that I did is I removed a number of bullet holes that had been, you know, in the panel. And the intent was not so much to pretend anything, but just to go back to the original panel. I don't think the bullet holes were there. They meant to be there, you know, <laughs> by the Anasazi. Okay, this one is another petroglyph um, in Southern California, actually in a location called the Coso Range, which is uh, a range of mountains near Ridgecrest, California. Uh, the interest of the Coso Range is that uh, it has some of the most amazing rock art in North America. Very few people know about its existence because it's on a naval weapons station, the China Lake uh, Naval Weapons Station, where they test, uh, for example, the Sidewinder missile. And so you have to have special permission from the base to go and access those panels. And of course you have to have a guide. And you can only stay a few hours, which means you can't do sunrise and you can't do sunset. So that, that, that creates, in a sense, a very interesting um, photographic situation because you've got to do your best in, in very awkward conditions. What I did is I f photographed only in open shade. That is nothing in the direct sunlight and nothing... Um, that would have a very high contrast. Everything in open shade using extremely saturated film. This is shot with Agfa Ultra, which in my personal understanding has a, even a, a higher contrast than Fuji Really? It's a negative film. And then um, in that particular image, I used a, a gold colored reflector to balance some I of the direct sunlight. I wondered where that warm yeah. light was coming from. Yeah, the mystery is revealed. Um, I balanced a little bit of light with the gold reflector onto the figure. Yeah, this is another photograph of rock art, uh, this time without the dramatic impact of a large rock art figure, just mm -hmm. uh, some uh, semi-abstract designs. You know, we really don't know exactly what those are. Um, but I, I'm not, like I said, in, I'm not very concerned about interpreting the meaning. I just saw a, a beautiful scene with uh, some flowers, some grasses, some, some desert varnish, and right. that was enough for me. Was this medium format or large yeah, format? Yeah, this is shot with the Hasselblad, probably with the 150 millimeter right. lens. The other one that we talked about before, the, uh, the one with the reflector, was shot with the super wide uh, 38 millimeter Biogon, Biogon right. mm, lens. This also looks like it was shot with uh, the Agfa Ultra film. All of them. Very uh -huh. saturated colors. Yeah, and, and if it wasn't saturated enough, I would uh, adjust that in Photoshop. Sure. Um, and that's nice because I have control of, as to how much or how little. Um, yeah, same canyon. These are all shot in a canyon called Little Petroglyph Canyon. Right. Um, this is one case in which revealing the location does nothing harmful because to go there, you've got to be surrounded by. Uh, <laughs> you You're on a missile base. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you, you, you gotta watch your conduct. Right. Um, this is an interesting one because it incorporates Mormon tea on the foreground. The green is uh, Mormon tea. And then some interesting lichen. And I had actually a lichen expert one day look at this photograph and he told me that there's just about every color of lichen that exists. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the way I approach these photographs is, for me, they are, they are beautiful photographs. The rock art being one of the elements. In, in here it's different, it is very much the, the definitive right. element, but in the other one it's one of the elements. Right, now this is a, just a close-up. Yeah, this is a close-up of this one here. Right. Um, so we have, uh, you know, this figure that now I zoomed in. Right. These were the two last shots I did on my last, well, yeah, my last visit to the canyon. I saw this as we were hiking out, and I was already the last one, and everybody was calling me. And I saw this, and I thought, no, I can't quite let this go. So I took these two photographs and got cursed for doing so <laughs> <laughs> by the rest of the group. Yeah, these are, right. these are big horn sheep, and uh, the blue comes from the fact that it was in the shade, and the shade turns blue. In that case, it turned extremely blue. Um, 
And that's a good opportunity to talk about the printing process because right. um, this is a this is a CMYK printing process, meaning that we have four colors: cyan, mm -hmm. magenta, yellow, and black. But these these are iris prints. They are done on fine art watercolor paper with a smooth uh, surface, cold press, surface. cold press, um, and uh, we are able to retain an immense amount of detail. Uh, but it's it's very complicated. It's more of a printmaking process. Yeah. Uh, well, these images certainly are unique. Thank you. You're welcome.